My guest today is Julia Dakin. Julia is a farmer in Casper who has partnered with Joseph Lofthaus, author of the book Land Race Gardening. They and others are creating an organization called Going to Seed, whose mission is to promote growing genetically diverse, promiscuously pollinated, locally adapted plants that can survive whatever get thrown at them. Welcome, Julia. So I had never heard of land race gardening before uh, preparing for this interview, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners haven't either. Listeners, we are going to take calls in the second half of the show. But before we get into that, can you tell me a little bit about your own background in farming, where you started, what inspired you to start farming? I have been farming full-time for only the last three and a half years since I moved from Ukiah. Before that, I've been farming part-time for quite a few years, but I didn't have the chance to focus on it full time till I moved. And that's been really great because farming is hard. <laughs> Amen. So, what drew me to farming um, was um, that it's typically very resource intensive, even organic farming, whether it's compost or <clears throat> conventional fertilizer. And it's really, a, you know, we all need to eat. And I wanted to develop a way or, or learn how to farm with fewer inputs. That's what got me started in the beginning. And I have been through a whole journey of, of, of what does that mean to farm without inputs? And at first I was really focused on the techniques. Then I was studying soil. And I think that's common in regenerative agriculture as we really focus on the soil. Uh, the, something happened about a year and a half ago that caused me to question sort of everything I, I had ever learned or been told. An uh, aha, we can get into that. An aha <laughs> yes. kind of moment. Can you tell us a little what you mean when you say regenerative farming? It's the idea that our farming practices are improving the the land, so they're not they're the opposite of resource extractive. That makes sense. That's a very succinct description. <laughs> um, so when you're talking about inputs, you're not talking necessarily about water, although you can do low water um, farming, certainly. But you're talking more about putting like nitrogen, calcium, um, other pesticides, even other additives into the... Do, do I have that right? Yeah, I guess I'm talking about everything. We use a lot of, of w water included, water, fertilizer, foliar sprays, plastics, um, the way we start plants. We use a lot of heat mats. We use rume. We have a lot of crop supporting um, materials, basically, and that's become pretty, pretty normal for us. So I didn't know what I was looking for exactly, but just a way to grow with less. I like that. There's certainly a lot of plastic <laughs> in farming and gardening. And I think it's, you know, sometimes a necessary evil. And I love that there are ways to move away from it. So you said you were really into studying soil and that your opinions on how to farm and soil inputs and everything changed dramatically about a year and a half ago. What happened? So what happened was that, okay, there's the Bionutrient Food Association, which over several years has gathered thousands of produce samples from all over the country. And they got it from, from farmers and from citizen scientists. And they also collected soil tests and farming techniques. So they have tested these produce samples and then you can compare that to, you know, what, what was in the soil? Was it, you know, high in calcium or low in calcium? What kind of fertilizer were using were they using? Were they doing no till or uh, lots of tillage, cover crops, irrigation? So there's tons of data. And their goal was to prove that regeneratively farmed produce is higher quality, um, more nutrient dense than conventionally farmed produce. So they did a ton of work on that, wrote these reports. I read the reports and wasn't satisfied because they weren't making the correlations that I thought they should be able to make. Oh, interesting. And so I, <laughs> because I'm I, someone who totally bought into all of that, but didn't do a very <laughs> deep dive. So I got my hands on the raw data and I spent weeks, two weeks on it because there was just so much information. I had to learn how to do scatter graphs and pivot tables and look for patterns. And I also could not find any. I looked for patterns, you know, was there a, a relationship between calcium in the soil and calcium in the tomato? Because there should be, according to what I learned. And there really wasn't. There 
were giant differences in these samples. So in one case, you could have a carrot that had 200 times more potassium than another carrot that was grown in the same soil on the same farm. Whoa. <laughs> so they're just not, not trivial. And there were patterns that I found, mm -hmm. and those were really all between varieties. They were genetic. So when I started sorting by color and then sorting by variety, there were patterns and that caused me to question everything else because previously I had assumed healthier soil would mean healthier produce, but that really wasn't what I found. In this data set, you could have conventionally non-organic produce samples that tested higher in antioxidants and other phytonutrients than a biodynamic sample if the variety was different. So that caused me to question this whole thing that I thought to be true where, you know, we've been told that our, our food quality has declined because our soil quality has declined over the last 70 years. There's, there's no question that, you know, our calcium, a lot of minerals are lower in the produce that we're eating now. Um, but the sort of conventional wisdom was that that was a decline in soil quality. So this deep dive into this data caused me to question a lot of the, those things, including that. And I started researching more. Yeah, that's what caused that wow. shift in my brain. So I sort of really thought that, you know, I've been wrong. I've been wrong for years to study soil tests and mineral amendments and how, you know, adding rock dust and, and making compost. It's not that those things aren't important. I think that they are really important. But if you care about certain things, they're one piece of a puzzle. And I was missing a very giant piece. The seeds. The seeds. Okay, so if you consider what else happened during the last 70 years, um, it was the Green Revolution. Green Revolution. Green Revolution. I'm like, I don't know about this Green Revolution. Okay, the Green Revolution. Yes, green, I'm with you. In which breeders were breeding for yield. So we went from this farm based system of, uh, you know, in, in the late 1800s, farmers weren't buying seeds. There were no seed companies. And then in the early 20th century, there are regional seed companies. But it wasn't until the 40s and 50s and after that giant national seed companies started existing. And these people were, were not breeding for the same things that farmers had been breeding for in the past. They wanted yield and shelf life. Whereas so, farmers had, I'm assuming, correct me if I'm wrong, been saving seeds for hardiness, um, how well they performed in their particular land, right? Exactly. And flavor. So and flavor, you, of course. How can I, right, how can I miss flavor? Yeah. Now, if you go to the grocery store, mm -hmm. the farmer's not going to suffer if his tomato doesn't taste good. It needs to look good, right. and it needs to sit on the shelf, and it needs to travel well, and he needs to have a lot of pounds of that. So that's been the trend. And when I started reading about this, there's a direct relationship between yield and quality. So the higher the yield, the lower the nutrient density. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't gloss over that. Say that again. That is... <laughs> That's that's big. Say that again. Yeah. So the more squash you get from a single plant, typically this is a pattern, not an individual thing, the less nutrient dense each squash will be. And that is a peer reviewed. There's no, I haven't seen any argument to that. I mean, it makes sense. If you stop to think about it, right? That one plant only has so much to give. It's a really complex topic because these plants were getting bred in high nutrient environments. So they were, were giving, they were getting um, synthetic nitrogen. And so their yield was high. And so they were being selected for high yield under high input environments. So there's a lot, there's, it's a complex topic. And I don't think that there's a general understanding, but there is a, the basic idea that when you select for certain things like shelf life and yield, you lose other things, and that is nutrition and flavor. Is there a correlation between nutrition and flavor? Yes. So what you're tasting, you know, is the, the volatile compounds, and those are linked to phytonutrients and antioxidants. You are blowing my mind right now. <laughs> 
So because if you think about it, you know, like we've all sort of accepted, especially if you don't have access to local um, seasonal produce, which some people don't, um, you know, we all know the grocery store tomato doesn't taste good, but you still think of it as eating a vegetable. And so you're still, you feel like you're doing something good for your body. Um, but now you're telling me and everybody listening that if it doesn't taste good, it's also not nourishing your body as well as a tomato that tastes good. Yeah, that's true. This has been happening for a long time. There's a book called Eating on the Wild Side, where she says that the process of domestication in general has caused our food not to be as nutritious because we tend to select for sweeter and blander. And that has taken thousands of years. But that has really sped up in the last um, few decades. We've really increased the rate at which we can select for sweetness and blandness and then i mean you anyone can buy a seed from anywhere in this global digital <laughs> economy so i certainly have bought seeds from not local <laughs> seed makers and you go to you know freedman's maybe or um uh, anywhere that sells seeds and you buy seeds from a company that maybe you think looks good and maybe they're even organic but that doesn't mean that they are regionally appropriate right that's right and seeds have plants have this process where they can adapt to local conditions i can say a few words about please that you, say a few words okay. about that and then we're really okay. going to get into land race garden, which we've okay. been building up to. so so this is the microbial side of it um and it's it's a little bit different, but I think it's it's important to understand because we, you know, the way that our seed industry has become multinational, it doesn't, it, we don't give plants a chance anymore. So the mother plant throughout her lifetime will develop relationships with different microbes that help her and they might protect the plant from disease or give scavenge for nutrients so then she'll take those microbes and replicate them throughout the plant and then deposit those onto the seed coat and inside the seed as it's forming so that second generation seed has an advantage in that if it's in that same location where it already has it's already inoculated with the microbes that are going to help it survive better so each time that we buy seeds from elsewhere like we'll buy seeds from johnny's um seeds and they're grown in a completely different environment well those microbes are pretty useless to us here especially because those plants were grown with plenty of fertilizer and plenty of water. The plant didn't struggle. So when it comes to a new environment, it's California and we have dry summers and it may be hotter or colder. And those plants tend to need a lot of support. And so when I was saying that plants have become weaker, um, that's really one reason is because they were grown in a completely different environment than what, what we have now, and they were selected for under that environment. So that's another thing that really um, caused me to look at locally adapting crops and land races is, is that scientific background of, of how plants actually functionally adapt to a local area and how by buying seeds every year we really don't let them and that causes us to need more fertilizers and need more water and all the things that we add to them does that make sense it makes so much sense so if i because i have like everybody i think who dabbles in a little gardening i have a container of seeds going back however many years um so you're saying if i planted those seeds but then saved their seeds then I'm getting that second generation benefit of the mother plant having adapted to her environment. But if I plant the seeds and then don't bother saving that second generation and then just plant with something else next year, like a different radish seed, <laughs> then, but since we're just like ripping those out, not letting them, you know, flower and go to seed, then we're losing all of those advantages. Yes, and there is another challenge that plants have that we impose on them. So I'll go back to this study and the data. After reading that, I thought that heirlooms must be the answer. They have, just by definition, they've escaped the, the tinkering and breeding that has affected all the other varieties. 
So the more I read, the more that seems like maybe not so much because heirlooms are really susceptible to disease. They tend to be pretty delicate. You can see that in like brand new wine tomatoes, at least for me, my tomatoes will typically die of some disease or other. And Um, bottom bottom rot. (laughs) Yeah. So we have a lot of complaints from farmers that heirlooms are delicate. They often don't produce a crop at all. And the reason for that is that they have been genetically isolated over, you know, the last 70 years. And each time that a plant self-pollinates or it pollinates with a close relative, it loses a little bit of genetic diversity. And that causes it to not be able to adapt or evolve. But so what I wanted to say about your, your seeds in light of that is that they are probably heirlooms or if they're open pollinated, they are still open pollinated within a very isolated population. Got it. So no, they, they, they're not self pollinating, but they're still not genetically diverse. And when you have a really narrow genetic base, <clears throat> um, you get, you get weakness, you get more disease susceptibility. So I would recommend when, when you plant those seeds that you have, let them cross pollinate because we have this sort of purity mindset that we want to keep things true to type. And that comes at a cost. Oh my gosh. Okay. Wow. I'm having so many thoughts right now. Yes. First of all, you just nailed it with the purity mindset. We live in purity culture. So of course it extends to our plants. I've always heard that if you let plants cross pollinate, which you are disabusing me of this idea, then you're going to get some less desirable, you know, derivative crop the next year. You're telling me that's not true? Yeah, uh, well, it depends on what you start with. So so I think that people have been told so many things about why they shouldn't save their seeds. You know, it's complicated. They will get bitter gourds instead of delicious squash or whatever it is. Um, And a lot of that is this fear mongering that I've I've come to see the more I talk to people and braiders and farmers that that are doing it. If you indiscriminately cross all kinds of things and you include genetics that you have no clue of, then yes, you might end up with some really weird things that don't taste good. But if you're choosing varieties that you like, then you'll end up with um, plants that are close to their parents. They'll become a mix of their parents, but they're not in almost all cases. They're not going to revert to some crazy wild ancestor. Does that make sense? We've, we have thousands of years of domestication behind these plants and, and those those dangerous or bitter, you know, genes aren't just lurking in the background waiting to jump out as soon as a non-breeder <laughs> crosses them. You know oh I mean? my gosh, I've been, I'm a sheep. I've been brainwashed. I just realized we never actually defined land race gardening. We just got right into a juicy conversation. Um, so let me just lay it out real quick and you can tell me if I've gotten this wrong in any way. My understanding is that the method of landrace gardening is a traditional way of growing food in which seeds are saved from the strongest plants grown in a particular garden and then planted in that garden and also offered to neighbors in the following year. And, you know, your neighbors who are saving seeds offer you uh, their strongest. And that creates hyper local varieties that can thrive and adapt to changing regional conditions. Shorter one, which I think you mentioned before, would be locally adapted genetically diverse and promiscuously pollinating populations. Yes. Okay. So the promiscuously pollinated doesn't refer to the number of pollinators. It refers to what we were just talking about, which is open pollination. Can you explain what that means? Like we sort of went deep into it without giving an overview of what open pollination is. Yeah. So open pollination it sounds it sounds good in that you're letting plants, plants cross pollinate with each other. The problem in the way that we do it in our modern times is that the plants tend to be very closely related. So you have a population of Lacinato kale, for example, and you really keep that strict. Don't introduce any new genetics. Keep them isolated f- for many many years, and so it's. Open pollination is problematic in that it tends to mean isolated and inbred. So promiscuously pollinating is just a clarification on that. It is open pollination, but it's encouraging diversity and crossing between varieties. So you would plant your, you know, your dino kale next to your curly kale next to your purple kale and let them all sort of like party out together? 
<laughs> like you grow one kind of kale, right, and save the seeds, and your neighbor grows a different kind of kale and saves the seeds, assuming both of those did really well. And then you each plant some of that the next year. Yes, I mean that's more of a overarching theory. In the in the past, you know, land race gardening, land race farming is really traditional, and so villages would have their own land race variety, basically, um, and so that is the broader definition of it. it's like the land race of an area got it um so sharing okay. the seeds is sort of like right now it is super hyper local because there aren't very many gardeners that are doing this so you're likely to be the only garden within your neighborhood that um but eventually maybe we can you know have bring back some of the the not the old land races but develop new ones that are what we want now they're sort of the modern land races so there are seven principles of land race gardening. One, save your own seeds. Good. Two, we- encourage diversity and not purity. Three, encourage selection by the local ecosystem. So if something doesn't do well in your garden, don't keep trying to plant it. Elizabeth, quit planting peppers. Uh, <laughs> four, be okay with diversity in the crop that you harvest, um, which I think is really important and overlooked that... You know, a plant might not give you what you're looking for, but it might still be yummy. Five, use as few inputs as possible, which you touched on earlier. Six, select for characteristics that you value. And seven, share your seeds. I like number six, select for characteristics that you value, because then that is really making your garden personal. Um, I might like a different, you know, tomato than than you might like and it doesn't really matter if you like my tomato or not if i like it tell me how you found land race gardening you were doing all this research you weren't satisfied uh with the results of the um sort of data studies that you were doing and then you were kind of left with like a well what what now situation yeah i was dumped i didn't want to be breeding my own varieties because that sounded hard and intimidating and I didn't have the patience for it. Um, so I just happened upon this book by Joseph Lofthouse, Land Race Gardening. And I read that and it sort of solved a lot of pieces for me, not just the nutrient density part of it, but growing with less um, because he really, really focuses on that, how you can choose the plants that do well in your soil and select those. And then you won't need to add so much in the in the future because you won't have these high maintenance varieties. So you Um, read his book and a light bulb went off or many light bulbs, it sounds like. And then you reached out to him, it sounds like. I did. I wanted more. I felt like I (laughs) (laughs) I was it was intriguing, but I wasn't ready to like jump off the cliff. You know what I mean? With mixing all my varieties. And that's just was way too much of a leap. So I told him he should do a video course. And he said, well, I have no plans for that, but someone should. And so I sat on that for a few months and I was like, well, I have to do it. Nobody else is doing it. And I suspected more people wanted more information just like I had. So I went to Utah last summer and spent a few days with Joseph in his garden, got a lot of video footage. And then I came back and then he actually came out to California in October and we did a few more days of um, footage from my tomatoes and my squash where he went through and, you know, on video, we talked about what we would save and what we wouldn't save and why and why not all those processes. So you found him, you said, make a video course. He said, nah, and then you made it. (laughs) You made the content you wanted. You were the change you wanted to see, Julia. (laughs) He didn't have, you know, he'd never done any video work before. And I'm not a videographer. I have not exactly made an online course before, but I was comfortable in video editing. And I just was like, I just need this. And so I'm going to do it. So, yeah, I made it. And he's been very supportive and really is into it. So um, it's been really nice. So I finished working on that over the winter. It was funny because we needed a new couch because I'd sat on the couch for so much time. <laughs> there was a Julia-sized <laughs> hole in your couch. <laughs> the pillows were all worn out. So we started accepting students in December. And there's 140 students now. And they're oh from all over the 
world, which has been really great to see how international it is. And through that, I've been able to um, talk to people who have been growing this way for a lot longer than I have. So for 10 years or something. So I've had a lot more interviews of those people. Um, and it's just given me a lot more perspective. So what is the setup of this online course? Is it you can take it anytime you want? Or is it like a, a an organized class where you go to classes, there's specific times, there's maybe online like group discussions? All the video content is there. It's not a ton. It'll probably take a few hours to get through it. And then it was designed to to be taken before the growing season. So that's really starting right now. Mm -hmm. Um, And then throughout the year, we have monthly calls with Joseph Lofthouse um, just to Um, go over any questions that come up. There's also a community space for people to interact with each other throughout the year, just because it's different. It's a whole mindset shift. And I think that people being able to support each other was really important. And I want to say one more thing. It's a mindset shift for us, uh, for me, um, growing up growing up in this industrialized country where really we're taught to add all these things to plants. But in other countries, and for the last 10,000 years, humans have been growing this way. And they've really, you know, the really yeah. sophisticated plant breeders that have grown and domesticated all of the crops that we eat today. So I'm coming at this from a Western perspective, but I I see that. And um, I just want to make sure people know that this is not something new or different. It's just new for some of us. Well, and there has been such a focus in really just in the last few years of returning tradition to traditional methods of a lot of things of growing food, of managing fire, of managing forests. Um, you can say traditional. Um, I would say a lot of people um, would consider those like indigenous practices. And it's really gratifying that that's getting the respect it deserves because it worked for so long. It's also really frustrating that we had to go so far in the other direction um, before we started like swinging back to um, maybe where we ought to be. Um, So I'm, yeah, this is, this is really interesting for me. Okay, Julia, I have never saved seeds. How does one save their seeds? It feels really complicated, and I'm guessing it isn't. Like, so, you literally just let it go to seed and then collect it? I mean, tell- <laughs> so, there, so let's t- let's take your peppers, for example. Let's go through a life of your peppers. You said they you A sad they life, well a you. sad, okay. sad life. So what I would recommend that you do if you were going to, you know, take this on is... Acquire various pepper varieties. So you might find five. They might be from online seed companies or from the grocery store or from your friends or wherever. As long as they're sweet peppers, just don't add hot peppers in there because you don't want hot mixed with sweet. Sure. (laughs) I mean, if you like a little roulette. (laughs) (laughs) No roulette in this case. Um, You might end up with 10 varieties. So plant a bunch of seeds. And, you know, some of them will come up well, some of them won't. You can call the ones that don't thrive from the beginning because they never will. Just plant a lot more than you need or that you want to end up with. And throughout the year, don't worry about them. Don't give them extra water. Don't fertilize them. You want to end up with um, the top 10%. So if 50% of your plants die, it's fine. That'll just be the first year. It's not going to stay like that. So the first year, 50% of your pepper plants might not make it. And then some of them will make fruit and then you'll select the best without worrying about flavor this first year. The first year, it's all about what survived, what what did nature cull, what self-eliminated. And in, in future years, once you have like a reliable, it's called Grex at first. A Grex is sort of a mix of different varieties. There. So um, <laughs> in the third and fourth year you can start selecting for flavor because at that time, the peppers, unless something drastic has changed, you're going to end up with seeds that thrive in your environment. And it really doesn't take long. Okay. All right. Okay. So then you have your best of your best. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Cut them open. Uh, Well, first of all, let them mature a lot, like a lot more than you would want to eat them at this stage. So um, let them mature. Like and almost then, start to go bad on the vine. Yes. Because mm-hmm. the longer you wait, the better the seed viability. Why? I did not know that. that. 
well, if you consider in, in nature, the pepper plant will kind of <clears throat> drop off the plant and then sit there in the dirt and then the different soil microbes will inoculate the seeds. So you don't necessarily want it to rot and you don't want animals to run off with it. So what I do is I let my tomatoes sort of get really ripe in a controlled environment, but on soil. So then for peppers, they're easy. They're dry. You don't, you just remove the peppers and let them dry at pretty much room temperature. If it's damp, you can <clears throat> have a fan over them, but don't let them get too warm. And then put them in an envelope. And just label them. And mm-hmm. Plant them next year. Yeah. And then next year, you can find a few more varieties if you want um, from seed swaps. You don't have to buy any and then mix them again. And, you know, your population can evolve. This is a lot to take in. I mean, it's it feels really simple. And I think it is actually, the way you're describing it feels intuitive. But we have been trained out of our intuition. And so it's a lot to wrap one's head around. How can people take your, like, where are you online? Tell me about, you're starting with Joseph Lofthouse. Um, you're starting an organization called Going to Seed. Yeah, so tell, tell me a little just, bit about going to seed. It's brand new and doesn't really exist yet, but I filed the nonprofit paperwork. Um, it's just that I want to be clear going forward, and it's important to Joseph too. He's under uh, a vow of poverty that this is not about making money. And there's been a, a painful recent history of, of seeds and corporatization and monopolization. And seeds and seed information, it really needs to be available to everyone in the world who wants it. And I've been lucky enough to be able to have the time to focus on this. Um, and so I just want to make sure it can get out there. Now, there is there is a paywall right now. It's um, $15 to sign up, and it's a, a monthly charge. And that's sort of to, to fund our expenses until we can... Um, get grants and donations for our expenses and then so there's two courses in there and that's sort of the starting place of you know where the organization is so that's all we have now Um, throughout this year and the next couple years we'll be adding more courses i'm going to go to mexico and film some um, farmers there and we'll be adding a seed library so that people can have genetically diverse seeds when they first sign up. Um, they're pretty hard to find now because everyone um, you know, is selling pure varieties. Sure. So it can take a while to get started in your land race because of that. I am all about food security, local food security, a strong local food system. And this feels like a really important piece of creating a strong local food system. I, I like the idea of not coddling plants because I, it's actually really freeing because I often feel like my garden suffers because I don't pay enough attention to it. But you are giving me permission to pay even less attention to it and just see what does well. Yeah, which I it think was is so, my last year was so much easier and less stressful than the year before because previously I would have looked up every tomato disease and I got them all. Um, and I got really stressed out every time something bad would happen. And then last year it was just like, well, that one's self eliminated. Great. And it's just relaxing. It's more like Zen gardening. So this year I'm going to be growing a lot of winter school winter squash, um, some zucchini land races. I have about 10 different kinds of zucchini that I mix together. And then I'll be selecting for the ones that are our strongest and survive without, you know, in drought conditions, because we don't have a lot of water um, in um, sandy soil without compost. So the, I'm also doing that with potatoes. I grow potatoes from true seed and I'm doing cucumbers and melons also and corn. So these are a lot of things typically that you don't grow outside here on the coast where it's so foggy. It'll be interesting <laughs> to hear how your corn does. Do students get access to Joseph seeds, each other's seeds? Is there sort of like a seed swap within the community of your, your students? Yeah, it's been casual this year just because it's so new. 
And for next year, we're planning on doing something more formal. Or each person that will join will get a you know a package of genetically diverse seeds that they can start with. So it won't be local to their environment, but it will be diverse enough so that some will do great and some won't, and they can select the ones that are that are the best. Julia Dakin, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I'm definitely going to have you on for a follow-up in the fall, hear how your year two has gone. Um, And thank you for starting something that has the potential to really impact our local food security. It's been a pleasure having you. This has been the Farm and Garden Show. I'm your host, Elizabeth Archer. Take care.